Hello everyone, this is track number three of Elixir Comp 2020. Parker Selberg is presenting distribution in restricted environments. Parker, the broadcast now belongs to you. Hey everybody, welcome to distribution in restricted environments. My name is Parker Selbert. This is my lovely wife there, Shannon. Uh, together, we run a consultancy outside of Chicago called Soren. I go by Soren2 on GitHub, Twitter, Slack, pretty much everywhere. Um, I also work at a company named DScout, which is based in Chicago and does mobile research. We're all about Elixir all the time. I also make uh, Oban and Oban Pro, as some people might be aware of, uh, which is fairly relevant to this talk, the, uh, the Oban Pro side of things. Um, definitely plays in to why we care about distribution in all environments. So when you heard about Erlang, there's a really good chance that uh, you heard it's a functional language, that it has great semantics for concurrency, and that it has this distribution story. Um, this quote is taken directly from the Distributomicon from Learn You Some Erlang, um, the, the great introduction that most people have gone through or many people have gone through. Um, and so that's part of the lore that distribute the built in distribution. And if you go to look at the Erlang documentation, it's right there, right up front. Um, it talks about nodes, which are individual servers in a way, although you can have multiple nodes on a server, uh, clusters, which are connections of nodes that can communicate with each other in this mesh like system, and discovery, which means that nodes can automatically find each other and form clusters. And there's um, a lot of primitives built into Erlang and also built into Elixir to utilize this. And then there are great libraries built on top of that, like libcluster, which have all of these different adapters to let you build a fully connected mesh. So here we have three nodes. Each node talks to the other nodes. Um, they're totally connected and um, they can send messages directly to each other. And so that's fantastic. It allows this distribution so you can spawn a process from one node on another one. You can call them transparently. You can use via tuples. You can have global processes. And you can monitor um, external nodes and respond when they die. And when this works, it's brilliant. Um, if you ignore the security issues and the scaling issues and uh, possible you know, uh, se separation um, when there are network errors, if you ignore all that, it works brilliantly. But it's not always possible. You can't always have this direct connection between the nodes. Um, there are different reasons for that, but one important one uh, we're going to look at right now. And so the Elixir survey results are later in the conference, but Brian Cartarella was nice enough to give me a little sneak preview um, of the section where we talk about deployment and where people deploy their applications to. And you can see with the, the little circles here, that I've highlighted Heroku and a couple of other items. And you can see 17% or just almost 500 of the respondents have their apps deployed on Heroku. And there's a good section there that are other, which means we don't really know the properties of the, the platform that they're running in. Uh, and then almost 17% that just aren't even in production yet. And this is really important because that means that 17.1% 17, 17 or more of the applications run in what I'm calling a restricted environment. And that means that communication between the nodes is restricted. And you can't actually form a cluster of those nodes because only the HTTP port is open uh, and they, they can't run an Erlang mesh. And this is because of Heroku's security practices. Um, so I'm focusing on Heroku here because uh, it's just a classic, very broadly used example, but sometimes companies might have other reasons why where they're running in an environment where they just don't expose those ports or they don't want the communication. And so in that situation, instead of having our happy little nodes talking to each other and unfully connected, they're isolated. They have no way to get traffic in and out or to discover each other or to have that conversation going. So we, I mean, people who have deployed Erlang or Elixir on Heroku 
they know about this. So why don't they just put their nodes somewhere else? Why don't they host somewhere else? Uh, well, maybe they could. I mean, if they really wanted it, they possibly could move, but it really matters when you're running a library. So like Oban, and we need that to work in every environment. A significant number of people running Oban run in Heroku and actually a, a significant number of people who have Oban Pro licenses, uh, which I particularly care about because they're clients of mine, they run in Heroku as well. And we can't tell them, all right, well now if you want to use these certain features, you need to migrate your entire platform somewhere else. That's just a non-starter. So some upcoming uh, Open Pro features will rely on this distributed computation that we talked about. So things like global rate limits, global concurrency limits, uh, global unique dispatch, um, those all rely on distributed computing. And we need some kind of mechanism to facilitate that. They can't just be a totally in isolation or you're going to violate uh, certain constraints or certain uh, SLAs that you might have with outside vendors. So where does that leave us? If we can't connect the nodes to each other directly. Well, we have databases or message brokers. There are a lot of them available, um, even on a platform like Heroku, things that you can just spin up. Uh, and here's a full kind of list of it. You'll see there's some SQL on there. There's Redis uh, and some message clients. Um, clearly, the giant elephant head indicates that I'm pretty partial to Postgres, um, but that should be fairly immaterial. There are just different options available that will let us connect, even in that restricted environment. So instead of connecting directly, everybody connects to the database, and then they can talk that way. So there are certain patterns that these different databases enable. So we could do a simulated RPC or remote procedure call. Uh, with RabbitMQ. So I could push a message over a queue and listen on a different queue. Or we could do some kind of leadership election um, by grabbing a key and setting expiration on it with Redis. Or we can do these kind of these locks using um, single rows and upserts and SQL. But what they all have in common as well is PubSub. So publish, subscribe. We can use topics and broadcast over that. And so that's the lowest common denominator. PubSub's available anywhere, any platform, any environment, and there are a lot of different options. So there, and it is very scalable, which is an issue that you will run into with um, fully connected meshes, although that story has gotten better. Uh, there's scaling issues once you get to a lot of chatter. So now if we look at PubSub using our database uh, chart from before, now that database is a message relay. So one node can talk to all the other nodes and vice versa. So they can be a publisher and a subscriber, and they can all just talk to each other. There's also great libraries that facilitate this. So we have Phoenix PubSub with a couple of different adapters, and that's pretty ubiquitous. We can use process groups, which will use distributed Erlang, or we can fall back to Redis or Postgres or any of those things, and it will work in any situation. So, I imagine we've all used PubSub to some extent, probably to talk to a client, um, maybe even to have communication between servers, but how does that work when we get into something that's a bit more advanced, where normally I'd have RPC, one node talking to another node, expecting reply, and has this flow of messages? Well, a great example of that is Raft, which is a distributed consensus protocol. Um, there have been some great talks on Raft before, uh, and, and there's some wonderful resources out there as well. Uh, the websites have little animated demos and they talk, they walk through um, the exact way that the, the paper, the original Raft paper outlines things. And those are great to explore. Um, that's a bit of a bigger topic than I can talk, cover in this talk. And it's been covered at least twice before at, at ElixirConf. So, wonderful talks to watch if you get the chance. But what we really want to focus on is how we're going, we can use PubSub for something that's normally the domain of RPC. And importantly, there are libraries out there in Elixir and Erlang that implement Raft. However, they all require and rely on uh, distributed Erlang to actually work. So we're gonna build a toy. And I'm focusing on toy here because it is not a complete 
implementation. We're just demonstrating the leadership election part of Raft, which is the first part um, and is a little bit simpler, but it will be enough to show the flow and give a taste of how you can use PubSub for this. Um, and I am gonna have the caveat that it does work on my machine. Hopefully it works on other people's machines in the future, uh, but maybe not in, his, in this exact form. So um, as I mentioned, there have been talks on Raft and they're great explanations, but we have to cover just a few topics and a little bit about the flow that's necessary for leadership election. And so that starts in these different states. Each node, which we're gonna call a peer later, um, what really matters, it's just an isolated unit that wants to have a certain state. And so that state could be a, a follower, a candidate, or a leader. Followers are fairly passive and they replicate state. Candidates want to become leaders and each cluster only has one leader. Seems fairly natural. We're gonna simplify that chart as we step through things. So you can see here with the fun squiggly arrows, the three different states and how we're going to transition through them. And these are the steps we're going to implement. So the first one is zero, which we just need to make a little mix project. So to do that, we're gonna make a new, we'll call it pub raft, very creatively named, and just set up two dependencies. So here I'm using Redis locally. It does not matter at all. Um, we only have Phoenix pub sub and Redis. And then we define a supervisor. So our supervision tree doesn't have much to it except for these two features. So one is PSUB, which is kind of like the namespace. It's what's required for us to connect all these channels um, in, in Phoenix PubSub, and then a size. So the size is crucial because it tells the cluster how large the cluster should be. So it doesn't, I mean, it's possible to have auto discovery in other ways and to dynamically size this, but for our purposes, we're gonna keep it kind of simple. So we'll say, our cluster should only have three nodes. And that's gonna be really critical when we want to figure out if we have a quorum, meaning do all the nodes agree on who the leader is? If they've all voted, do we have a majority of the votes? And that will play into it. We're gonna hard code that right up front. And then we just add two different children to our supervision tree, the PubSub, uh, the, the Phoenix PubSub, and then our peer. And our peer is using the node name, which is fairly important. Uh, as a unique identifier, and then just passing those other P sub and size uh, values through. So now we're going to look at the peer, and the peer is going to start in the follower state. So there it is. It just started right up. It doesn't know anything. It is a, a newborn, and it can wait to hear something, or it, it can uh, it can become a candidate itself. But, um, so this is ideally suited to a state machine. I've used the word state several times, but gen statum, which is amazing, is pretty hard to step through. So if you're not that familiar with gen statum, um, I'm hoping more people are familiar with gen server and we're gonna kind of mend, uh, meld gen server to, to make it work with what we're talking about. And then we're gonna find a state module. This is really all the state that we have. We'll, work on some of these other terms as we go through it. Um, but it's fairly simple. Uh, the most important though, for this first initial step are these two keys. So these two fields, uh, the leader, which we're gonna set up as none. It has no idea who the leader is when the node starts and the mode. So it's gonna start in the follower mode. And then critically, uh, we're going to subscribe to the raft channel. So PubSub works over channels, which are just like little sub namespaces within that global P sub kind of namespace. And that's gonna let the nodes pass and listen to messages directly on that one channel. So now it's started up, we we'll move on to the next stage. So if a follower doesn't hear from a leader, they become a candidate themselves, which makes sense. So there's that arrow jumping from follower over to candidate. And we're gonna start this with a timeout. So to prevent stalemates, imagine two nodes starting up at the same time, becoming candidates for the same, at the same time, and then vying to become leader. We wanna randomize that a little bit. So we give them this timeout range. 
And whereas before we just initialized and subscribed, now we're gonna schedule a little timeout. And that timeout is going to send us a message in the future. So randomly between 150 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds after things start, we send ourselves a little timeout message. And then we handle the timeout. Uh, because this is our first bit, we're just gonna immediately become a candidate, pretend we don't have any sense of modes. And becoming a candidate means that we assert there's no leader, we're now a candidate, and we're gonna bump the term. Terms are very important because they, one, prevent stalemates, and they also let us know which nodes have been around longer. So we start up in term zero, and when we become a candidate, we immediately bump to number one. Um, and then we're gonna broadcast that out. So this is the other really critical part. Whereas we've now um, subscribed to the RAF channel, now we can broadcast on the RAF channel, and we're gonna send out this tuple, this three tuple uh, for request vote. And we're gonna pass along who we are. Because we don't have an RPC mechanism, the candidates can't just talk to all the other nodes individually, so they don't know who's responding, and they will also get their own messages, which is really important, uh, which is what makes it so important to pass through uh, the node and the term. So you're saying, I'm now a candidate, I am alpha, beta, gamma, whoever, whoever you are, and here's my term. So they've requested the votes. Now the other nodes are going to listen for these votes. This is the, portion, but the part where the candidate can loop. So if they request votes and they don't hear from anybody, they'll have a little timeout and then they'll become a candidate again and they'll announce it again. But if they do hear from another candidate that has a higher term than them, they'll fall back to follower and they'll stop their candidacy altogether. So here it is where we're handling that request vote message. So right up at the top, we're gonna to do a, a case to check the term to see if this term, how it matches up against what we have locally and also to check the vote. So checking the term, we wanna see, is it newer? Is it the same as ours or is it older? What we primarily care about is that it's newer and that somebody's requesting a vote for a term that's higher than mine, which means that they started earlier than I did. And then we also want to see check vote. So in this case, we wanna see, did we already vote for somebody? Because if we didn't vote for somebody, then we're free to vote in this election. But if we already voted, then there's no point and we can just schedule a timeout and go back to doing our, our usual loop. And so the case that we primarily care about is that it's a newer term than ours and we haven't voted. And in that case, we're gonna broadcast a new message, which is a respond vote. And you can see the tuple there. We're passing through who we are again, uh, the term and where it's coming from. And so in this case, the from is the person that, well, not the person, there's no people, uh, the node that requested the vote. So we're letting them know we voted for you and here we are and here's the term. And then we record that we voted for them and we schedule our timeout. You'll notice um, for simplification's sake and to fit all this on one slide, uh, it's not the most normalized. We're just sending no reply and scheduling a timeout over and over again. The timeout keeps each node doing its thing and keeps it alive. So now we move on to step four, which is the candidate becomes the leader if it gets votes from a majority of the nodes. There we go, you can see it's going to possibly become the leader and optionally fall back to follower, depending on what other messages it might get. And so we can see up top, we're handling this respond vote message uh, that was sent before. And we have a slightly more complex case statement. In this case, we wanna know um, if they voted for us. So we check who we are, if the term is newer or the same, and if there's a quorum. And so the quorum means whether we have a majority of the votes. So simple majority is all it is here. If you have three nodes, then two is a majority and that's a quorum. If you have five nodes, then three is a majority and so on. And in the initial case, if we have one node respond and we're hoping to get say two to three votes, well, then we have no quorum. So we just record that vote, save it for the next round and we schedule a timeout and then wait a little bit longer. We get another message. All right, well, this one's for us. It's the same term again, which is great. And now we have a quorum, which means that we are the leader. We've won the election. So we're gonna set ourselves to leader mode. We're gonna clear everything else back out. And then we're gonna publish a new message. 
which is to announce our leadership. So we're using uh, vote here and vote in this case is really us. It's our node. We're giving everybody our name um, and we're sending out the term. And then all the other nodes, including ourselves, will get that message announcing the leader. In that case, we wanna check who we are and check the term. So if it's from us and it's the same term, great, we're already leader, there's nothing to do. Schedule a timeout so we can move on to the next phase. Otherwise, um, if it's newer than whatever we have, all right, well now they're the leader and now we're a follower and we'll go back to our little loop waiting to hear from them, which takes us to set five, which is that leaders send out heartbeat messages. So when we started back up as a follower, we waited to hear from a leader and only when we didn't hear from a leader did we become the candidate. And now that we are the leader, we need to broadcast out to everybody to let them know that we're in charge and uh, that they can't be candidates. And so we do that with a little heartbeat timeout. It's important that this is shorter than the election timeout, um, although the numbers are all kind of fluid. Some implementations have a much higher timeout and I probably wouldn't use 75 milliseconds for, um, for something realistically. The raft paper says 50, but for demonstration purposes, this works out fine. And so in our little handle timeout message, as the leader, now we just send heartbeat. And heartbeat is another broadcast. We send a little tuple again, the heartbeat, the node, and the term. And that's it. They just listen for this. They handle that message, which looks the same as pretty much everything else. So we're going to skip over that little bit of code. And they keep sending the leader back to that if they don't have one. And things kind of just chug along from there. So one of the things about implementing Raft, which makes it um, fun, but also challenging, is that you can't just do part of it. There's all these messages and flows and to test it, you need to have everything working. So we couldn't just step through and have a little test assertion or, or poke at it. But now that we have a full implementation and we've seen all the code, we can um, set this handle call. So we can reach in and find out who's the leader. Who do you think the leader is for any particular node? And then this is a little bit on the outside. We can just ask our peer who it thinks the leader is. So now we're going to do a, a quick demonstration. It's not live just due to the pitfalls of doing, you know, coordinating three nodes on your same machine. Uh, but I promise that it's not been tampered with and it's totally just what it would normally, you know, how it would flow, what it looks like. So we see we start up Alpha, Gamma, and Delta. They all connect to each other. They immediately see who's a follower and who's a leader. We can ask any one of them who's the leader. Oh, okay. Well, they seem to concur that Gamma is the leader. We can ask any of them. And then we can go and we can stop Gamma. All right, well, the leader's not there anymore. And so they vote for somebody else. When we bring Gamma back up, it gets a little leadership notification. And now it knows that somebody else became the leader. So we can check who that is. And now we know that it's alpha. So as soon as a node exits, because those heartbeats stop, they can take over. And then they just, they jump and fill right in. And this is really important. We have this primitive for leadership. And that means we can also do other things built on top of that, uh, like replicating state. So we can have this consensus that the leader can be in charge of broadcasting that state to other nodes. And then they can use that to coordinate between themselves in a way that would be really hard if you were using, um, you know, Postgres like, uh, tables or Redis keys or something, because you'd have this constant information exchange when you want to do something like global queue concurrency. So we use those examples again, those nodes, which are peers nodes. Uh, we have alpha, gamma, and delta. If we had a setup where we're running jobs in our queues, and we might have three different servers or five servers, we don't really know, but we only want to run one queue, like one job at a time ever for business reasons. Um, that's really difficult to do unless the nodes all can talk to each other and coordinate. So in this case, Alpha um, is the leader. And so we can use that to coordinate so that Alpha will tell each node you know, what their limit is. And so in this case, Alpha has the limit. Uh, this global limit of one and everybody else is scaled down to zero and they don't actually run anything. 
And so if we change that limit, alpha as the leader can then delegate out and broadcast out to everybody else and control what they're doing. And we can use this to build all of those different features that we talked about before and do all of the little distributed computing wizardry that we wanted um, purely using PubSub. So lean on centralization as long as possible. If you can put things in a database, use the database. Uh, that's what they're there for. You can be sure that anything you put in there is going to stick and that everybody has consensus because it's all going into one centralized place. That's not always possible or it's just too noisy. And in that case, use one of the established distribution libraries. They're fantastic. Things like RAW or the older Raft. Uh, there are plenty of libraries out there. It's actually ridiculous how many different um, talks and libraries there are if you look between languages. It's, it's really daunting to look at, but fun and very important for when I was building this, um, I used a combination of Squabble and Raft to look at how they had flowed between things and kind of piece things together. So thanks for listening. Um, hopefully you can take a little bit of inspiration from this. And remember, if you can't get things working, you still have PubSub and it's worth a lot and you can build a lot more on it than just talking to clients on the, on the front end. Um, and for Open Pro, we're gonna use it to build some really great enterprise kind of features. And uh, I hope that you're there to see it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parker. That was a very interesting talk.